facilities. Um, so let us start on today's topic, which I call the European future, not strictly a economic topic. Um, nevertheless, one I think that is something that we have spoken about in the past, and it's very difficult to ignore this because behind much of the political turmoil on the continent and in Europe is this question of the European future and what it entails and whose future it is. The chart that you're seeing now, as usual, I have a, uh, I have the chat up. So if you have any questions or comments or jokes or anything you'd like to add to the chat, let me know. Just put it up there and I will see it on the chat. Um, I also am operating on a new system here, as I said last week. And for the moment, I don't see where the system went. Ah, I know what happened. Uh-oh. Hold on. Okay, let me just check to make sure that everything's good. I want to make sure I'm right on the system. Something very odd happened here. My uh, video controller disappeared but my chat and other systems are still up. I don't know quite what to make of that. So I'm just checking to find out we're all in good shape, in which case we will roll away. Adinda, can you hear me? Can the rest of the people here see the picture and are we ready to go? Hmm. Okay, I have the word. We're ready to go. Let us go. My apologies, folks. Uh, as you know, the one thing I don't really want to do is have to look at my own my own picture during this. So I will put up a sheet. Okay. Sorry about that delay. As I've said many times, a great technology, but slightly imperfect, or at least as my tech advisors advise me here it's not the technology that's imperfect it's the user yes the old user tech joke which never goes away and I refer to them and say well listen the reason you have a job is because there are users here that need your assistance do not diss the user at any rate let us go there's a lot of turmoil elections all sorts of good stuff in Europe this year we've already had a dose of that last year with Britain. Britain is a part of Europe, whatever else the Europeans and the Brits say. She, the country clearly has played a integral, pivotal role, if you'll like, in the history of the European continent, of which they are not a part of the continent, but they are certainly part of European civilization, whatever that means. So what is the chart we're looking at here? It's projections out 100 years, approximately a little less, to for population. Population is a driving force 
But because it always appears below the event horizon, as you might say, the what we consider, what we talk about, what enters in our discussions, both on economics and politics and other things, it tends to get ignored. The history of the industrial world, of the industrial West, certainly, but now it's becoming the industrial world, period, meaning India's included, China's included, East Asia's included, Africa's included. The whole world is now joining the industrial societies that began in the West in the 19th century. And for that entire period, the assumption from history and from experience, but also from the advent of the Industrial Revolution, say 1750, whatever, whatever date you want to put on it, has been an assumption of rising populations. As a matter of fact, it's been such a secure assumption that no one's ever really questioned it. It never really came into the society's consideration that that would not be the case. If you go back only 40 years to the late 70s, uh, late 60s, early 70s, and on through the 80s, the concern, there's the famous um, Paul Ehrlich book, prophesying, what's that book called? Population Explosion, I forget the name of it. Um, prophesying Doom. By the late 70s, there will be mass starvation. By the 80s, wars over food, water, resources. The doom that was foreseen for mankind, let alone Europe, but for mankind, was one of ever increasing. It's the Soylent Green. I don't know if you know that movie. It's a movie, uh, Charlton Heston has been made once or twice also. And it takes this to a scientific extreme. Soylent Green is really reprocessed humans as food. Um, it's an interesting idea. We seem to be given as a species to Armageddonic visions, both in religion and in culture. But that was a, that was the reality that was thought to be waiting just literally around the corner for mankind. It's sort of been trans, transmuted now into the climate change catastrophe, which is supposedly waiting for us around the corner. My guess is that you'll find the same accuracy in both criteria in, in both in both um, situations. But back to the one we have here. The reality that was foreseen was not reality, of course. It was a forecast. It was based on models that projected in the 60s current rates of population explosion, population growth, and current productive capacity in Food stuff. That's primarily what it was based on. Also, um, the idea behind this is, of course, peak oil. A little bit later, same idea. Of course, neither one happened. The peak in oil was a very brief peak, and then it crashed. And it still has not recovered. I believe it's $49 now. Um, the oil scarcity never happened. And it never happened because new technology came along to exploit further um, shale oil and oil tar sands, oil deposits. And the same thing happened with food. The starvation that should have long since wiped out, I don't know, half the population of the planet. Remember, we're in 2017 now. There's supposed to be wars over food and resources back in the seven, late 70s and early 80s um, never happened. 
So, you know, I'm going to look up that Paul Ehrlich book and uh, give you tell you what it is. So just bear with me one second here because I think it's certainly uh, here. Hold on. Yes, here we go. Here we go. What's the book? The popul Oh, it is the population bomb. I was right. Okay. There you go. I think it's called the population explosion. Anyway, um, let me remove this. Okay, so that never happened. The reality that was so securely predicted by many, many, many people. I'm just picking on Pearl, Paul Ehrlich because he's the his book is the best known of these wrong-headed predictions. By and large, uh, you know, it seems like uh, human culture and human society advances aside from the academic realm. At any rate, they didn't happen. But the reality is quite different. And it looks right now like it will be quite different. Now, maybe this, again, is the same type of erroneous projection, where you take current trends and simply push them into the future. The reason this doesn't work and has been proven not to work is because Technological society and human culture is not a static creature. They were wrong in the late 19th century when someone confidently asserted that all the technology had been invented. There wouldn't be anything new. So the predictions of mass starvation did not count for new techniques, new substances, new fertilizers in the production of food. So what happened instead of the population outstripping the food supply, the food supply outstripped the population. Instead of peak oil, we have an oil price that has to be artificially supported so that it doesn't crash. I mean that's what the, that's what the well, that's what OPEC is attempting to do. They are not bringing more production online because they're making so much money they're trying to restrict production to force prices up. So the fallacy in these types of model based projections is you can't account for changes in technology and in culture. At least technology. Let's leave technology there. Let's deal with culture in a second. So this is, again, a linear, essentially linear projection of current population growth. Population is a very predictable feature of human culture. And a very standard change has been the richer society gets, the fewer children the members of that society have. So at this chart here, we can see that China peaks somewhere around in population at around, uh, it's about 2025 maybe. The blue, which is Europe, peaks somewhere about the same time. The United States, interestingly, continues higher the whole time. Brazil peaks and goes down, and Nigeria, at least, I'm not sure why that is, shows an ever-increasing population. This does not include, unfortunately, this chart, the Islamic world, um, which is a key ingredient in this discussion. So this is the background behind what we're going to talk about. And we must keep that in mind because it's driving <clears throat> more than, <clears throat> excuse me, a bit 
of the politician of the politics of this issue. Let me just bring this stuff back up here. Excuse me for a moment. Okay, one, one more here. Sorry, folks. Where's the chat? That is not the chat. I just want to bring the chat up in case anyone has any comments that they'd like to add to it. Okay, let me just bring up the Forex Street chat. Okay, here we go. Okay, now. Here we go. Here goes the latest chart. Application window. Okay. Now, this chart, this graph, this graphic representation of what's going on in, in Europe, gives you the economic background to what we just looked at in the chart. Although maybe they're different, let's talk about them. Let me tell you what we're going to talk about here. What I wrote in the edit for this is the European future. I said, whatever the outcome of the Dutch, French, German, Italian elections this year, nothing will ever be the same for the euro and the EU. The confident future of the ever closer union has been shattered by the departure of the United Kingdom. Nationalist movements in Holland, France, and Italy, and an immigration crisis that has suddenly made the danger of the continent's population decline manifest. Can nationalism, with its attendant dangers in history, restore a sense of purpose to Europe's federal institutions? How can an economic union averaging 1% growth plan for the next generation? The West, the United States, and Europe, and Japan, and now China is a part of it too, and India is in this, and also many other countries, uh, except a good deal of them in the Islamic world, has experienced the past 70 years, and actually it goes way back, but the, it goes back to the, to, the end of the, to the end of the 19th century, to the post-Civil War era in the United States. And you could say the post uh, Franco-Prussian War era in continental Europe and in Europe back to 1850 at least. It's a steady, inexorable improvement in standards of living. In general, we have to ask, because this is an anomalous period in the history of the world. I don't think you could find another period. The only other period I could think of where, it, where there is such a steady improvement over what we think is a long time, but remember, it's really not. Even if we take it from 1850, you have basically 150 years, maybe 200 years, a little less, 167 years of unidirectional growth. And this is, despite the catastrophes of the European, of European history in the 20th century, and there were three great catastrophes. The First World War, the Second World War, and between them and stretching beyond them, the rise of the Soviet Empire. Which if you want to measure deaths, is right up there with the best of them. So despite those catastrophes, European society materially, and I think I would say culturally, uh, progressed steadily for 150 years. One of the backgrounds for that progress has been I don't think it's appreciated, the dynamic impact of a growing population. After all, GDP is a function of productivity and, and the number of people working. I mean, that's really all it is. It's a 
relatively simplistic measure of a culture's of a, of a nation's output, and GDP will fall when the population starts to decline unless productivity makes up the difference. And it's very debatable, and I would say it's impossible for productivity to make up that difference. But we are now facing, and we're not sure why, a different world. Now look at this, and we're talking specifically about Europe. So look specifically at, look at this display. It is giving you the per capita, percent per capita change for the past approximately 20 years. And what is so striking about it? It's that Italy has stagnated. Greece, we could say, is a different case, but we know why. Cyprus, remember Cyprus had the same debt crisis problem that Greece did, or very similar. They had a banking crisis in Cyprus. Czech Republic as well. Parts of Europe, and more than just parts, have experienced some of their lowest growth rates in since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, if you count out the wars, of course. The countries that are experiencing the greatest growth rates, look at them. Um, Eastern Europe, the Baltic Republics, Belarus, Poland, and the Western marches of the old Soviet Empire. And what's going on there? Well, economic growth and progress stagnated rather severely under the Soviets. And their communist ideology did not produce much prosperity for anybody, except maybe the nomenclatura, the people who ran the place. And so those countries have a large degree of what we would call infrastructure spending to catch up. And that's what you're seeing there. But for places like, and where, another, another interesting fact here. I mentioned three countries, um, actually four, that are having potential land, um, elections this year, which could severely destabilize the EU and the EMU. Uh, I saw recently, the first one is actually in two days. It's in Holland, which is not one of the countries that has the lowest growth uh, per capita in Europe over here. The Netherlands right here, Holland or the Netherlands. I have seen recent reports that uh, Gert Wilders' lead has, he's lost his uh, political lead. However, I would be much as the polls before the American election and the polls before the British Brexit election were routinely wrong, I would be very doubtful of polls coming out of Holland right now. Gert Wilders is a supremely anti-establishment candidate. The policies he espouses and the causes that he is attempting to put into power are anathema to the European establishment and certainly to the establishment in Holland. And I'm not surprised that you would see polls like that. Whether they turn out to be accurate or not, we will know in two days, which will be interesting. So, but of those countries that I mentioned, France and Italy, of the four, have some of the slowest or non-existent per capita growth in the past 20 years. One of the absolute drivers of the last of the, of the presidential election here in the United States was that a large area or large areas of the United States have dropped out of the economic progress, the economic life of the country. Those people can all vote. They vote in Italy, they vote in France, they vote in the Czech Republic. 
Greece, they vote. But Greece is much as such a small country that they could not buck the trend or the power of the rest of the EU. That is not true in France and Italy and even in Holland. The countries, the people running in Holland, Gerd Wilders has said he will take his country out of the euro if they if he gains power now, even if he wins the election, meaning gets a plurality of the votes and a plurality of the, the seats in the uh, Netherlands legislature, I believe there are 150 seats. At the most, his party might win 35 or 40 seats if they have a tremendously good showing. The other parties in the election have said that they will not participate in a coalition government with Mr. Wilder, so it's still questionable even if he wins the election whether or not he would be able to form a government. Um, on the other hand, he would get the first crack at it. At any rate, we will see. The election is, I believe, in two days, on the 15th. The idea of a European Federal Union, we have spoken about it in passing and once or twice in, di in direct uh, webinars, um, is a product of the first 50 years and the catastrophes thereof in European history of the, of the 20th century. In my mind, probably the most tragic war, um, because it was fought over nothing, basically, of certainly European history was the First World War. The ruling philosophies in Germany at the time, in Austria, which was an empire at the time, nominally anyway, um, France, the UK, Italy, Russia, which was an empire, all shared a profoundly, not if not uniform, at least very consonant culture across the continent. The old balance of power regime system, which had lasted in Europe for hundreds of years, was inadequate to deal with the destructive potentials of the new technology. The hundred years between Napoleon, his defeat at Waterloo in 1815, and the beginning of the First World War in 1914 were probably the most profound change on any culture, any nations in the history of the world. The Napoleonic Wars went on for 20 years. They actually were beginning in the French Revolution. They were wars of the French Republic and then into the Napoleonic Wars and the French Empire and the First Empire. They adhered to the balance of power regime, although Napoleon did a good job to upset this by being very successful, that had been working and functioning in Europe between the, the monarchical powers in Europe for hundreds of years, since the Middle Ages, essentially. And what they permitted was wars to not dislocate the general run of culture. Even the Napoleonic Wars, as extensive and wide flung as they were, because they were fought all around the world, did not severely undermine European culture. The last wars that did were the religious wars in Germany in the 17th century, which depopulated a good portion of Germany by about a third, if I remember. When Sweden under Gustav Adolphus made its one and only uh, foray really into continental European, forceful foray into continental uh, European history. And after the Napoleonic Wars, 
Europe essentially, not completely, had 100 years of peace. Yes, there were wars here and there, of course. There was the Franco-Prussian War. There was the Crimea War um, among the majors. But that progress brought to Europe capacities for destruction and apparently the willingness to use them that had not really existed ever before in history, although certainly the Mongol and Tartar or Tartar invasions of the 13th century were viewed as the coming of the end of the world by many people. They never really penetrated beyond Russia. They did not make it to the heartland of the European continent, which is what we're looking at here. So the disaster of the First World War, and then, of course, the Second World War, which is, as Churchill referred to them as a new 30 years war that phraseology never really caught on. Uh, who was it done? Marshall Foch, who said after the treaty, signing of the Treaty of Versailles, this is not a peace treaty, it's an armistice for 20 years, which turned out to be almost exactly right. That catastrophe is what's behind the European Union. And whatever you think of the bureaucratic imperatives and the bureaucratic silliness, if you will, of a regime, uh, essentially an unelected, unelected bureaucrats in Brussels ruling over the continent in many ways. And that is certainly one of the things that prompted the UK to leave. The idea behind this vision of the European future was most assuredly grounded in reality, the reality of the first 50 years of the 20th century. If you are looking for a vision, a political vision, avoiding a repetition is a laudable, a repetition of that period is a laudable goal. It doesn't mean it is a possible goal. But it does mean that it is one which should surely be attempted. And it is. The European Union, the EMU, the Euro, the surgeon zone, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, of borderless travel within the European Union are accomplishments are political accomplishments, vast political accomplishments. But two things have happened since then that also, that have not been effectively dealt with, maybe they can't be, by the governments of the European Union. And it, it's quite possible that the flaw in the European project is one that is inherent in trying to weld a series of very different nation states. I mean, you know, the old idea, the beginning idea that the European Union and the Euro will force Italians to become Germans does not turn out to be true. It's not even getting the Italians to be the French or the Spanish. The issues of culture, I think we are discovering, have not been erased by 50 years of the ever closer union. Turns out that one of mankind's deepest urges is the urge of tribal association. And the largest entity that can obtain a population's loyalty seems to be the nation state. Part of this, a large part of this is cultural and linguistic. You will naturally feel closer to people with whom you can have a conversation. 
who share your culture. This is a natural function of the way the species is constructed. But we are finding that this tribal instinct, which almost demeans it, and I don't mean to do so, is something which must be dealt with in political inst within political institutions, especially supranational political institutions that are not imperial in nature. Imperial meaning enforced in the last resort by military force of an overlord. The Ottoman, the, if you will, Russian, in a more recent version, the Russian um, Soviet Empire in Eastern Europe. All of the nations that you're looking at here, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, all of these nations out to the border of over here, all of this area, except in Greece, was part of the Soviet Empire, and that was enforced by a military overlord in Moscow. Given their choice, and it's not a supposition to say, because it's since been proven, since these are all independent nations now, it's clear that given their choice at the end of the Second World War, none of these nations would have chosen, perhaps Belarus and Ukraine, I, I don't know enough about the situations there, my guess is no, would have been chosen to be ruled from Moscow. So the last empire to collapse in Europe was the Soviet empire. And all the prior ones are gone. So unless you have a imperial system enforced by a successful military power, military conqueror, nations tend to re revert to their cultural boundaries, their linguistic and cultural boundaries, which is what we're seeing here. So for the, and that's exactly what this map looks like. So in order for the European Union to be successful, It has to deliver, uh, excuse me for a second. Sorry, it's a sneeze, folks. Ah, pass. It has to deliver what the Chinese government has delivered in the post Deng Xiaoping era economic growth. And this map is showing you that. In the older, more important sections, meaning they have more sway since they consider themselves France, Germany, and Italy basically as the center, but Spain is there too of the European Union and the European Monetary Union. You must deliver economic growth, but they haven't. This is one issue behind what we're seeing in Europe. You could say it's a reverse. Reverse reversion. You know, there's a very, the very uh, standard, one of the standard tools in technical analysis, reversion to the mean. And you could make a cultural <laughs> uh, equation there and saying that what's happening in Europe now is reversion to the nationalist mean. Nationalism as a mean for European culture. We are certain we have certainly gotten relatively we have certainly gotten far away from that as the European Union has proceeded in its attempts to bind the nations of Europe closer together and that the populations are now taking their opinion to revert to the mean of European history the European European history being, at the mean, far more national and divisive than the EU and the EMU are attempting to forge. The other issue, of course, is the map we looked at earlier. And it's tied to this one as well, it's population. As I mentioned, population and GDP is a function of productivity in the population. If the population starts to fall, the GDP will too, unless it's made up by productivity increases, which are uh, 
impossible to deliver on that kind of scale. Well, the other issue with population increases, and this is, I'm sure, although it's not mentioned, and certainly Angela Merkel didn't say so, was the behind the decision to accept millions of Eastern European, I mean, Eastern Islamic refugees from the Eastern portions of the Mediterranean basin. And that's population decline. It is not possible to know, to think, that the nation, the governing people, the elites in Germany and Belgium and Sweden and France and Italy and UK did not know some of the risks that were inherent in this type of population transfer. Cultures and the people in them are tribal. The idea of a new European man and woman created out of Brussels is a false one. It is almost as false as the idea of a new Soviet man back in the 20s that the new economic system in Russia would create a new man, a new type of citizen would evolve with different loyalties. And that did not happen. And it would not, you know, the other thing about this map is this is essentially, not quite, but, but close to the map of Europe between the wars between the First and the Second World War. Poland was independent. All of these countries are independent. Most of these countries are independent between the wars as well. So their history as independent nations has a much longer, you can say that in, in down in the Balkan Peninsula down here, that the nations always tended to be far more cultural um, and often ruled by someone else. Um, but that's not true of all of these nations, um, at any rate. So the second problem, the first problem that the Europeans are facing is stagnating growth. The second problem that they're facing is cultural. And neither problem can be dealt with. This is the biggest issue for the EU neither problem can be dealt with. In fact, both issues are exasper exacerbated by the type of rule that comes from Belgium. And I don't mean from Belgium, I mean from the EU bureaucracy in Brussels. The EU and its Financial institution, of course, the European Central Bank, the ECB, have not benefited, by and large, Europe's population. Pretty much since the advent of the Euro, France, Portugal, and Italy, and surprisingly Denmark, have not really grown. That means the lives of their citizens. 20 years is a long time. So it's very difficult to make the economic case for the Euro and the European Union if you're in France, if you're in Italy, and the other nations that are in Greece, you might say, forget about it. Nobody in Greece is going to be making, they may not be able to free themselves um, from the European Union and the, e, and the EMU, but no one in Greece is going to be making an argument for the benefits to the Greek population of the European Union, because there isn't any. There's only been pain. 
without assessing blame or anything like that. The fact is, it's been a disaster for the Greek population. So if you want to make an argument for the European Union, you can't make it economically, at least not to most of the populations of most of these countries. The, Europe, the UK, the English, already made this determination that the European Union does not benefit them. Now, it wasn't a great majority, but it was nonetheless a majority. So the argument that the ever closer union in Europe is supported by the economic facts is simply not the case. Now, Germany, and you could say Finland and some of the other countries have benefited from the weaker than otherwise currency, and that's probably true. But it has not worked to the majority's benefit on the continent. So you can't make the economic argument in France. You can't make the economic argument for the spread, for the ever tighter hold of the EU on the economic life of these countries. You can't make that argument because it's simply not true. And after 20 years, everybody knows it. You can make other arguments. You can make the political argument. You could make the moral argument, as many have certainly for refugees. There is a moral argument in favor of letting in these desperate people, although they're primarily men. But you can make the economic argument because it's false, and everybody knows it's false. So for the European Union to proceed along the path that it has envisioned, one of the greatest props has been kicked away. Much as if the rulers in Beijing were unable, and this may be the case, we don't know, to deliver enough economic growth to continue to raise and create wealth across the country and raise more and more people, the standards of living of more and more people. When that stops to be the case, then one of the strongest rationales of the rulers for their own rule has been removed. So you have the removal in the European future right now, the confident future that everyone had foreseen up until the financial crisis, but really the real tipping point, the real change was not the financial crisis. That just made it manifest. It was the advent of the euro. Because the euro did not make everyone the same. It simply inflicted penalties on some and benefits on others. And since those were not uniformly applied, and they can't be because you can't have a financial policy that works for the entire continent because they're all different. The real pivot, in my mind, in the history of the European Union, will in the future be seen as the euro. The continent and its nations were clearly not ready for the economic and cultural imposition of the euro. And what has happened is that the euro has exacerbated, has made worse the differences between some of the primary nations of the European Union. And this is now made evident in their economies. And this um, map that we're looking at, and now, I think we're going to talk about briefly here, in the political movements on the continent. We spoke about the Netherlands earlier. Yeah. 
the moral argument for letting in lots and lots of refugees from different cultures is an impeccable one. It's a humanitarian one. It may or may not be a realistic one. And when I say realistic, I don't mean by any other standard than w whether it will permit the overall, whether it will advance the overall goal, which is the ever closer union, which has been in place for 70 years of the European elites, of, of the ruling elites in all these countries. You know, Germany's government is pro-EU. France's current government, Hollande, is pro-EU. The Italian under Enzi was pro-EU and, and all the way back. The groups, and I use them, I use the term elites mainly because it's, there's really not another equivalent term um, across an entire culture. It's interesting you see that, you know, everyone thinks I have, I mean, I had some friends over, we had some friends over last night early and um, everyone sort of views, and I certainly did before a, a long, and, well, um, that Manhattan is this great cosmopolitan place, that everyone's alone there, but in fact, the, for the people who actually live in Manhattan, um, they have, they run a, it's like almost like living in a small town. It doesn't seem like it, or a small city. Um, but the kinds of chance occurrences that occur in a smaller place happen over and over again in Manhattan. Your children go to the same schools. You have houses in the same place. And, and, and so you run across all the time in this busy, populated, crowded place in your social circles, you run into the same people. This person knows this person. This person's married to someone's daughter. I mean, it goes on and on and on. We ran across it last night and we were laughing over it. So, so the idea of a group of people, uh, an elite running a, running a country, or at least having a lot to do with the power levers is not a, it's not a false concept. It's a very accurate concept when it comes to how countries are ruled. I'm sure this is true in France, in Paris, which is the center of France. I'm sure it's true in London which is a center. I'm sure it's true in Rome and Milan. You know, so it goes on and on and on. It's true in every culture. It's a, human, it's a, it's a function of human culture. At any rate. So all of the elites who run the countries in, in Europe are pro-Euro, are pro and most of them are pro-EU. I mean, they're pro-EU, and most of them are pro-Euro as well. But the sort of the humanitarian and the... Uh, free border transfers throughout the EU mean that when Germany decides to let in two million refugees, they are allowed to go anywhere in Europe, essentially. That whatever Germany's reasons for doing this, and you can say that they're humanitarian, that's certainly what the German government will say. My guess is behind that is the idea of population decline that you saw earlier. I think I have some more maps of that, but I'm going to leave those out. So the inherent, and, and I'm, I'm even avoiding the cultural ideas of whether European culture is, in sense, some sense, I, I was going to say played out, but that's probably the wrong term. It is the wrong term. It is has always been true, I, Japan is worse, that the wealthier a country becomes, at least in the modern world, um, the fewer children people have. So that's not a cultural attribute, meaning that's not, that's not um, inherent in one particular culture, if you make the case, because even if you make the case that Italy, France, and Germany, and Spain, they all have the same culture, and they don't. Um, that they're all part of this Western European culture, which is really not true. Um, they have profoundly different cultures um, in many of the things that matter, in modes of behavior, in approach to work, and all sorts of things. They are different cultures. 
but because we know that it's true in Japan as well, which has a totally different non-European culture, yet the advent of wealth there has been this has had the same effect. The population slows, the production of children drops, and eventually we are seeing now on the cusp the population starts to decline. So that seems to be a, a law of human society, not of any particular culture. But it doesn't really matter when it comes to nation states. Left unattended over a hundred years, what happens? Well, populations start to decline as they are currently declining at ever increasing rates in Japan. The competitive nature of our species has not dissipated. Europe, with declining populations and ever declining numbers of young men to serve in the military, becomes over time a great temptation. Where this leads, I don't have an answer, but it is clearly a topic on the minds of Europeans. In Netherlands and in France, in Holland and in France, there are elections within the next several months. Actually, uh, France is April, and then May, I think, or is it March and May, and, and uh, the Netherlands is this month, on the 15th. And Italy, I expect this year, although there are no elections have been called yet. That will go a long way to determining the future of the immediate future of the European Union, meaning Gert Wilders forms a government, the UAEU has big problems. If Marine Le Pen forms a government, the EU and the Euro have great problems. But even if they don't, the notions and the problems, the population and economic problems behind these issues are only going to get worse. There isn't any, I mean, maybe Germany's letting in two million refugees will solve the problem for Europe, but I don't think so. The twin problems, and they're interrelated, of course, of economic growth and population decline, are facing almost all of the map that we're looking at. It's worse in Russia. Almost this entire map is facing increasing population stagnation and then decline over the next few generations. And unless a solution is found to the economic and the population problems, I don't see how, well, the question is this, can nationalism as being evinced in France and Italy, the Netherlands and Germany and the UK and other nations to come guaranteed in Poland currently, provide the force, the energy, to reinvigorate European institutions. The EU, the ECB, the EMU. Because these institutions need to both be reformed and re-energized. Europe is losing very rapidly its vision of the founders of the EU. And the energy, intellectual and physical, meaning voting people in the streets, to make these institutions work. When it, it's, like the, it's like what happened to the Soviet Union. In the end, the Soviet Union collapsed because no one was willing to defend it. It had failed.
And the question is, is that the future that awaits the EU institutions? There is no, I know European, my friend, European friends who, uh, who have, if they hear this lecture, will take great issue with me on this. And I'll get a dose of it this summer, of course, because I'm going to go spend a couple of weeks in Italy with my family, um, my family here and also my family in Italy. Um, most of you who are pro-EU and, uh, you know, the, the ruling part of the ruling group uh, groups in the, in the countries, and they're all very passionately pro-EU. Um, in in France and in in Paris and in Italy and various places and many other places in, on the continent. So I will hear. Uh, we'll certainly talk about over wine and dinner. We'll certainly have some political discussions this summer, which I'm very much looking forward to. So there is a continent-wide class support for the European institutions. How motivated it is, how organized it is, and whether it has the ability to sway politics. Because the pro-European class voters, it's not just a class, population, electorate, in Europe is represented by the institutionalized, no, institutionalized is the wrong word, by the institutions and the people of the institutions currently in power, who for many reasons and for many people, maybe not a majority yet, have become discredited, certainly in the eyes of Marie Le Pen's, Marine Le Pen's supporters, certainly in the eyes of the supporters of the Five Star Movement in Italy, of uh, Gerd Wilders supporters in the Netherlands, of the Brexit supporters in the UK. That is where the passion lies in European politics. And it's difficult to see how that passion gets transferred to supporting European, pan-European institutions, the European Union and the EMU. Just as a side note to this, another version, again, we're back to the reversion to the mean, the mean in there, the mean in European history are nation states. If we are reverting to the mean, then we have a very exciting few decades ahead of us. For those of us who last a few more decades, I'm assuming we all will. Uh, as a side note to this, um, Nicola Sturgeon, Spurgeon, I think, or is it Sturgeon? Sturgeon, like the fish. Um, the um, first minister of Scotland has said that unless the terms being considered for the uh, British UK exit from the EU are changed, then she will call, and I think they need Westminster's um, Permission, but I can't see Westminster saying no, meaning the, the uh, UK government of London, to have to hold a new sp a Scottish independence vote in 2018. And this, if it goes through, I find fascinating because in that case, you will have a real electoral test. of what populations, how much of a population really believes in the European idea, the EU idea. It's gonna be fascinating to watch. The, uh, they voted 62 to 48, I think, against Brexit in Scotland. They had voted prior to that, two years before that, 55, 45 to stay in the UK. Will Scotland vote to continue under the rule, the dictates of the European Union out of Brussels? 
So there we have our future. It's going to be an interesting few decades. Okay, folks, I thank you very much for attending. Um, we will do this again next week. Um, just a note on our interviews I do uh, with Conjunctures FX Street. I'm doing a series of interviews uh, every week on Wednesday. We call them market direction interviews. I'm interviewing all sorts of people who are, I think, uh, of use, who, whose ideas, thoughts, and observations, and histories are of interest to, well, I hope to everyone, but certainly to the people who are interested in trading your uh, currencies and just economics, global economics in general. Just one note on that. Um, please look on the FX Street site to see if we are going to have one this Wednesday. The problem, of course, as you may not know, we have this enormous snowstorm barreling down on the Northeast starting tonight. It may snow for 24 hours or more. And if that does, does happen, we may have to reschedule this week's uh, interview. At any, at any rate, I thank you all very much for attending. I will post my email address as always. If anyone has any comments or questions, please let me know and I'll be very happy to answer them. Again, thank everyone at FX Street for the facilities here to do this. And everyone have a great day. Take care.